you had a day. You were like emotionally drained when I saw you when you came home. Um, what was it? Uh, what was it like? I mean, we could see it. Brock and I were watching it with the sound down. Could not believe some of the incredible moments that I saw afterwards. What was it like in that building? It was, first of all, inc incredibly humbling to be there. Yeah. It was as intimate as a 20,000-person stadium can be. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, was, it was really amazing, Rich. I walked up. I went with Lisa Salters, our good friend from ESPN. And uh, we went in, and I found myself sitting amongst the teammates and coaches and training staff from the three-peat team. And that moment I started to cry. You, you know, you, you all of a sudden felt the enormity, the weight uh, of all these people who are united in that one place for this player that we'd seen grow up before our eyes. You know, as you know, I, I met him in, in 1999. Yeah, the first three-peat team. And, um, and, and everyone was hugging. It was so intimate, so close. And the music was so overwhelming. Uh, Christina Aguilera sounded like an angel singing Ave Maria, watching Alicia Keys play Moonlight Sonata right in front of our eyes there, and just watching everyone holding hands. That was the most intimate thing that hit me there. Is that right? There was so much love from so many adversaries in the room. Um, we'll hear it later from Doc Rivers talking about how cathartic it was for the city. And it really was because in the same way that people would chant Kobe – during games, every so often there was somebody that would yell from the rafters, we love you, Vanessa, we love you, Kobe. And it would punctuate the silence, punctuate the sadness in the room. The levity that came at times was needed. But what really made me stop and think was just how poised Vanessa Lane Bryant was. I, I mean, I, I, I met her when she was 17 and a half, when she was a kid. She was a little arrogant. I think she was a little insecure. And, and to listen to her speak at length about her child and about her husband and the line that killed me, and you would know this for obvious reasons with our life, she said with the next round of kids, she'll never be able to have Kobe at her side when he mm. needs to pull her out of the kindergarten when they drop off Bianca or drop off Capri. And that line killed me because we've just been through that with our daughter in, in kindergarten this year. And the other line was um, for Gianna, which was that she'll never be able to dress her for her wedding, watch her walk down the aisle with Kobe and, and never have that daddy-daughter dance. I can't. I mean, we were watching her with the sound down, right, because we were on the air yesterday. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe her poise. I, I couldn't I thought, either. I thought about, obviously, you on the spot. Like, how do you how do you talk? I know that she's had a few weeks to compose herself, but it's, there's not enough time. There's never there's maybe never enough time. No. And the fact that uh, it's interesting that you said all the adversaries that were in the, in in the in the arena yesterday who were just, I mean, it started all. I, I I'm not fully aware of the Jordan Kobe relationship, how it evolved and how it started. I'm sure arrogant and insecure would be a way to describe. Kobe as well when he came into the league and talked about Jordan and his titles and wanting to be better than Michael and everybody saying okay we got that and then Jordan speaking yesterday at Kobe's memorial just I'll ask you this point blank I know we didn't discuss it we didn't discuss much because I figured we'd, we'd talk about it on the air that's our relationship by the way um, what do you think Kobe would have thought about it I think he would have been embarrassed by the intention and he would have loved it at the same time. Because, you know, it was affirmation that he made it, that he was what he said he was going to be. That's really what it was. Look, Kobe would have loved that it had been for him and it would have slayed him alive that it was for Gianna. So it was a double-edged sword. So that's what I was thinking in the room my God, if only Kobe could be here to see this, and yet it would slay him because it meant his daughter went with him. And I think when Gianna said that God took the two of them together because they couldn't survive on this planet without each other, mm. another gut-wrenching moment because 
their relationship was so tight and so intense. Even if you looked and they showed myriad photographs, really intimate photographs of the family. Right. And almost all the time you'd see Vanessa with the three littlest girls. And there was always Gianna wound to Kobe's side. And every picture, those are his eyes, those almond-shaped slanted eyes. That's Kobe. That was his face. And she mentioned that Gianna had the grin that she had, that Cheshire cat grin. But to me, I looked at all these pictures of Kobe when he was younger, and that was the same grin. So he would have loved it. He would have loved the attention because, let's face it, Kobe wanted to be the greatest. Like, as they mentioned yesterday, Rob Palenka talked about learning Moonlight mm-hmm. Sonata in a couple of days. Right. Because, by, of course, he by did. By ear. By, by ear. ear. And, right. And I believe it was Jimmy Kimmel who said, uh, Kobe's up there saying, I'm going to be better than Alicia Keys at Moonlight Sonata. But that was how he approached every single thing. The Mamba mentality. The Mamba mentality. Right. For more of The Rich Eisen Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV for free on BR Live or download The Rich Eisen Show app.